Time is 6.30. Uh, today is Tuesday, December 13th. I'd like to call this regularly scheduled planning and zoning meeting to order. May I have a roll call, please? Delori. Mata. Onken. Here. Gara. Here. Spiegel. Mata is here. Here. James. Chase. Here. Here. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. Next, uh, item number three, minutes, uh, 3A, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting minutes for November 8th, 2022, regular, regular meeting, and November 17th, 2022, special called meeting. Uh, may I have a motion, please? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Motion to approve item 3A. There is a motion. Would anyone like to second it? Second. Thank you. It's been uh, moved by Vice Chair Chase, seconded by Commissioner Stegall. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Item number four, citizen comments. At this time, there are any members of the public who would like to speak. We invite you up now. We ask that you limit your time to three minutes, that you state your name for the record. If you've not filled out a comments form yet, please do so. Um, I have a couple comments forms. Um, first, Ms. Evangelina Chapa. Thank you, uh, Evangelina Chapa. I just want to compliment y'all on what a great job y'all did with the downtown master plan and going through it, reviewing it. And I was just as confused, not knowing what was going on, but I appreciate the the time that y'all took to explain or what, how y'all were just as confused as probably as me. I, I didn't know when this master, I know it's, I read on it, I think it said September 3rd or 19 of 2019, and I just wondered if this was a plan from the revitalization time, because that's right about the time that they had hired the, the firm to the downtown master plan. So I didn't know if it was part of that, but I appreciate your time and your work that you spent in looking it over, and, and hopefully it'll get fixed up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapa. Um, next, uh, um, uh, Rebecca Chop. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Chapa. Um, I just had some concerns regarding the um, current comprehensive plan data collection that's been going on the one in October at the Krug building and the recent one at the Waterworks last weekend. I'm just a little confused on how this data that it seems pretty minimal on getting collecting throughout the, the city is supposed to help um, the, um, the firm develop these plan or assist and what you know, the comprehensive plan. Um, I feel even from the beginning at looking at what the previous and older uh, plans, and I know that they keep getting re revised, but I still don't feel like the city and the community are, and the businesses are coming together properly to be able to assist with what should be the best way for Kyle to improve their um, growth and um, keeping some of the historical area. I would assume that the comprehensive plan would be really consisting of north, east, south, and west areas, um, developing or offering them in their own sections, and then improving, uh, starting in an area that needs to be started, and then if those other three sections would uh, need to be revised, there would be still time, but I don't feel like that's what's going on here. I feel like there's other people who say that there's a comprehensive plan, but yet we still have these major developments going on, and they're not always following within what those have been. Um, that's just my concern, and I'm hoping with the, the data that was collected this past weekend and the continuation of it, will help in some aspects, but I really think the city needs to have more of a um, sit down with community businesses and city staff to come together and see if there's a compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is all the forms I have. If there's anyone else who would like to come up, you may come up now. Okay, seeing none, I will close citizen comments. Citizen comments is now closed. 
Uh, item number five, consent agenda. We have consent agenda items A and B. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Make a motion to approve consent items 5A and B. Thank you. It's been moved by Vice Chair Chase. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Vice Chair Chase, seconded by uh, Commissioner Stegall. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Uh, item number six. Uh, six, uh, consider impossible action. 6A, consider request to construct an approximately 52,963 square feet retail building located at 5755 Kyle Parkway within the I-35 Overlay District. Hobby Lobby dash conditional use permit. CUP-22-0070. Uh, Ms. Sharp. All right, Kayla Sharp, city planner for the record. Um, we have a conditional use permit for um, architectural review for Hobby Lobby, which will be within the I-35 overlay um, just next to Lowe's. Building materials are consisting primarily of concrete tilt wall and stone with some concrete masonry units and other um, detailed materials um, as appropriate. Um, staff has found that this is compliant with the overlay and asks that the Planning and Zoning Commission approve this item. And also just for reference, this is next to Academy, so it kind of shares a wall with Academy. Any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Okay. Yes. The uh, plan says on the right elevation that there will be an adjacent tenant. That's Academy. That's Academy. Do we have the, the scale of the building, like how many feet wide, how many feet long it is to make sure that it's compliant with everything? Um, not on these plans. However, they do already have um, site development plans that have been reviewed and approved by staff. So from that perspective, they have been approved and found compliant with all of our codes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Motion to approve item 6A. Thank you, I'll go ahead and second. Uh, it's been moved by uh, Vice Chair Chase, seconded by myself. Is there any discussion on that motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Um, next, item number seven, workshop. 7A, discussion with Verdunity regarding Kyle 2030, the city of Kyle's proposed comprehensive plan. Mr. Atkinson. Uh, Will Atkinson, planning director for the record. Um, this item, we have Verdunity on the line. Um, they did ask us earlier to make sure that um, as y'all speak up, just make sure y'all are stating your name um, and what have you and, and direct your uh, attention towards the the screen as well so they can just make sure there's appropriate contact and communication as well so but uh, we'll go ahead and let them have the floor good evening aj Favre with virginity for the record can everyone hear me okay yes yes ma'am yes okay. yes we can great thank you so much i will share my screen i want to go over um, and frame our discussion for this evening um, before I do that, yes, I'm glad that Will brought that up. Please understand that we uh, are seeing you on a very small screen, uh, seeing the entire dais. So in order for us to make sure that we understand who's speaking um, and make sure that we can capture all of the input appropriately, we just ask that you keep the cross conversations to a minimum. And if you can, let us know um, who's speaking. That way we can make sure that we capture that appropriately. So I will start with just giving some background 
um, as to where we are in the process and how we'll be moving forward. So if you'll bear with me for one moment, please. Okay, can you please confirm that you're seeing the slides for me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm realizing that as I'm speaking with you and have running the presentation, I actually cannot see uh, the dais at all. And so I'll ask for um, your help in, in helping us navigate that. So our workshop this evening is focused on decision-making principles, and I'm glad that we were able to hear some of the public comment that was just shared. Um, I think the sentiments are spot on as we look at putting together an update to your comprehensive plan. So I will talk in just a moment about the different phases in the project and how public engagement will be woven into those different phases. Um, I'll also be speaking briefly to set the stage for what our purpose is this evening and how that will also be factored into the creation of the plan. So as a reminder of where we've been and where we're going, this is the project timeline for the comprehensive plan. Uh, as you can see, we are, near, we are nearing excuse me, the end of that first phase, which is our assessment phase, uh, which is largely, as you can imagine, a lot of data collection uh, reviewing and also getting to know your community. So how have we been doing that? We've been focusing on this um, through one of the uh, first events that was held that was mentioned earlier in public comment. Um, the feedback from that particular event and other events the city has been holding during that time, utilizing some of the same activities and questions are gonna be really formulaic in putting the plan together and why is that? Well, in order for us to put a plan together for a community that isn't a one-size-fits-all generic approach, we have to really understand the identity of the community, if that exists, um, how that can be articulated, and understand the vision that the community has moving forward. So many of the different engagement activities that have been done to date are focused on drilling down into the different elements that make Kyle unique, um, the challenges and opportunities that are available in Kyle, um, getting a really good understanding of the process that the city has gone through in the last few years with some of the plans that have been adopted and trying to ensure that this plan unifies all of those efforts cohesively and builds on them further. Of course, as you'll recall, the end goal here is to make sure that we have provided you with a playbook by which you can execute and pursue that vision. After the first of the year, we'll be moving into phase two of this effort, which is the exploratory phase, where we'll be focusing primarily on future land use and mobility, as well as growth scenarios and parks and public space. We will be coming back to Kyle and doing a series of events in February. And those events will be focused on taking what we learned in this first assessment phase and building on those to then start looking very specifically at the growth that's occurring in Kyle, where that's occurring, why that's occurring, what type of growth is occurring, and then trying to ascertain how we can best help you to guide that growth in a way that is most productive, um, not only in the sense of perception of productivity, but also in the sense of fiscal productivity. So to that end, we've also been working on your land use fiscal analysis during this time. And so again, we'll be moving through phases three, four, and five uh, with adoption of that document happening in fall of next year. So tonight our topic is decision-making principles and why are those important? Well, the, one of the main reasons that's important is because we need to be able to take the values that are important to Kyle, but put those into practice. Unfortunately, we hear the word values a lot when we're talking about planning for a community, and there's a lot of discussion about what people find important to them and to their community and the community's future, but there's a missing link that's often there. And that missing link is often, how do you take these things that are very personal, um, that have some emotion-based um, elements to them, and how do you actually apply those to making decisions on behalf of the community. And so these decision-making principles 
bridge that gap, so to speak. Another way that they're really important for you all is they empower and guide those decisions and provide a foundation for explaining the why behind decisions. One of the most frustrating things for people that live in any community is when they see decisions being made, but they don't necessarily understand the logic, the conclusions that were reached and how that came about. And so these are fundamental elements in being able to provide and present to your community a very transparent decision-making process so that they can understand how you reached those conclusions and why those decisions were made. Furthermore, they act as a barometer to ground the decision-making discussions themselves. Um, as you all well know, being on board, a board and commission is something that you do on top of all of your other commitments to the community. And it would be impossible for any one individual board or council member to know and be a subject matter expert in every single type of decision that's brought before them for discussion and for ultimately uh, decisions on spending policy and other related items. So how do we make those discussions as fruitful as possible? Well, we utilize these decision-making principles so that you are comparing each and everything that you're faced with against these principles and using them to help guide the discussion so that it can be productive and so that you can, again, show the connection and the link between the discussion that was held and the ultimate decisions that were made. So how will your input from tonight be utilized? Well, number one, I want to be clear that this is not the only time that we'll be having a discussion of these decision-making principles. This is one element. Um, we have been working with the city on the second community-wide survey, which will go out in January, and it will focus on decision-making principles. Um, and so we have started having some discussions with the community about this in our first visit. We will be building on those, and the questions that have been formatted um, take some take some leeway um, from the different things that we have heard and kind of try to um, substantiate that in some way so that we can see if there's agreement in a widespread manner across the community about those. Those principles that rank the highest and are viewed as being the most embraced and most important to your community will be paired with some guidance for future decisions as part of the comprehensive plan. So these are very central to the ultimate goal of being able to implement this plan. And so we want to begin with the end in mind and set that up today by starting to have some of these discussions with you. So our exercise tonight um, contains a series of those principles. There's a total of 10. And we have chosen to rank our time based on the rankings that you all provided us in the poll that was sent out last week to the Planning and Zoning Commission members. That will enable us to put our time where it makes the most sense in the beginning. And as time allows, we'll run through and, and speak about all of the other principles in this list as well. Now, we want to make sure that we understand how these principles would work in Kyle. So as an example, uh, we may be having a discussion about a principle that is focused on making sure that there are neighborhoods and housing for everyone in Kyle. And so we'll ask you to think about that and we'll give you a minute or two to think about that, to jot down any notes that you have about that particular principle. And what we want to help have you help us work through from your perspectives there locally is how that principle could be applied. What types of decisions that Kyle faces um, are decisions that should incorporate these types of principles? And what do those decisions look like when they're made according to these principles? We want to understand what successful decision making looks like from the opinions of you all as the steering committee for the comprehensive plan. So our goal this evening, um, by the end of our session with you all, which I anticipate will probably run between 60 and 90 minutes, just depending on the discussion, but we do want to make sure we allow adequate time for everyone um, to speak, so we will stay as long as needed. Uh, the ultimate goal is to arrive at the conclusion by the end of this workshop with you all, some examples of decisions where you'd like to see those principles applied that we can take back we can work um, amongst ourselves internally and draft some language for the plan that illustrates to any decision maker and to residents in Kyle how these will be used. 
Likewise, we want to understand how success can be illustrated so that we can make sure and build that into the plan, giving you not only some guidance on how to make decisions, but illustrations for your council uh, and other groups as to what decisions are successful when these are applied. So we'll start with talking um, first with this one, which received the highest ranking from all of you as being one that you felt was particularly important, which is the decision-making principle of being open and transparent. Now, transparency is a word that we hear very frequently when we're doing feedback in communities, and everyone has their own take on what that means. And so you're our barometer this evening and helping us understand what you believe that means uh, there locally in Kyle. So the first question we're gonna ask you to consider tonight is to think about the types of city decisions where open and transparent principles um, make the most sense to apply. Some examples of types of city decisions, just so you can be thinking about those, could be um, anything that is perhaps budgetary in nature, that is organizationally um, managed, that is policy driven, um, that is planning based, um, that is regulation applications. Uh, those are all different types of city decisions where this principle of openness and transparency could be applied. So I'll pause for a moment and ask you all to think about this for a moment. Uh, you may be um, in a position where you can perhaps jot down some notes or just think through what you think this means, um, not only from your current position, but as a resident. Um, and let's hear from you all about that for a moment. Would anyone like to start? This is uh, Commissioner Chase. So um, I think you you kind of rattled off a, a list that that I would have them on. So um, your budgetary process, um, your permitting process, uh, requirements and in, in permitting. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our building code. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Um, uh, this is Commissioner Guerra. Uh, the first thing that popped into my head when I was thinking about Kyle specifically was uh, we sometimes, you know, Kyle does have 35 going down the middle of it, and we do sometimes think of Kyle as east side and west side sometimes, and 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 why decisions are made for something to go in on one side of the one side of the city versus the other. I think uh, um, a lot of times, you know. East side might feel like we're just houses. We don't have much there. Well, West side does get, you know, things. And so transparency is, is to why things are going in, especially uh, one side of the city versus the other. Okay. Those are three excellent examples. Any others that you'd like to add? And then we can drill down into those a little deeper. This might be okay. more specific. Well, let's start with those three. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Commissioner no, Onkin. Uh, this might be too specific, but I know that we've had conversations before about the use of water and concerns around uh, restrictions on water use and the, the strain on that resource in the community and understanding how some of those decisions are made, I think would interest a lot of people. Excellent example. Okay, let's drill yeah, into a few of those uh, if we can. Oh, please, I'm sorry. Commissioner Muffin? Yes. No, no, it's fine, hey, I didn't realize, I wasn't unmuted on the way in. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree uh, with, with uh, the chair. Uh, the, you know, with transparency, you know, it's kind of almost seems divided, you know, things that happen on the west side versus on the east side of Kyle, you know, yeah, it does seem like, hey, you know, what about us? <laughs> Mm -hmm. As a resident of the, the east side, of, you know, there's a lot of things that just, you know, it's not fair, you know, how come, you know, but the west side has a, a library, the west side has this and that, but on the east side, we just have houses. So 
go. But yeah, just transparency, you know, just, yeah, there's so much there. So, that's all Excellent. I have. And sorry, I, I have <laughs> my wife's out of town, so I'm having to drive to pick up the kids. That's okay. Sorry, Thank you so down. much for, for sharing <laughs> that. Excellent example. Well, let's talk about a few of those for a moment. I think those are terrific examples. So going back um, to the beginning, I think the first one that I heard uh, was budgeting. And so let's talk about kind of the next um, phase of this discussion, which is, you know, what do decisions look like um, when these things are applied? And I'm sorry, I am... Um, There we go. That should be working now. So some examples of decisions that sort of uphold, if you will, this principle. So when we're talking about budgeting, what does budgeting look like in a city when it's done openly and transparently? Are there a couple of examples that you could name that would be goals, if you will, for making the budgetary process as open and transparent as possible? Question from Commissioner Onkin. Are we talking about an annual budget that the city does? Or I think that makes the most sense to, okay. to focus on, yes. Okay. Another way to think about this perhaps is what is it about the budgeting process that the public might find challenging and what would the opposite of that be? Commissioner Stiegel, what I've found in the community that there's a uh, definite uh, misunderstanding as regarding operational uh, budget versus debt accumulation, and it creates a great deal of confusion and upset. Uh, I've run into that several times. That's an excellent point. Just talking about the different elements um, of that related to line item versus debt, that is something that we can certainly look into more and make some good suggestions on, I think. Do we feel like the public generally understands what's up for discussion at budget time? Is that an area that perhaps could be more open and transparent? This is uh, Commissioner Trace. So I, I would say that, that Transparency and open, especially during a budget process, um, I don't think we're necessarily bad at it. I, I wouldn't say that in the least. Um, I think it has more to do with apathy than it does anything else. Um, I mean, there's there's council okay. meetings that, that uh, anybody can attend and, and listen to these discussions and the explanations. Um, I think where you get lost and you were, you were trailing on this is, is explanation about uh, certain aspects of the budget that might uh, affect individuals. I mean, during the, during the, the, the streets, uh, the most recent bond that, that passed, I saw nothing but negativity online. Go, Great, this isn't going to pass. Luckily, it did pass. Um, but I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, part of it is apathy as well, so reaching out to individuals uh, within the city to to get them to to pay attention to the information that's that's already out there. I think that can apply to to all of these items. I think you're right. And understanding how it affects them to your point, that was something else that I took away from what you said. Um, let's go on just for a moment. Uh, there was another item that was second after budgeting. Karina, can you remind me what the next item was? Sorry, trying to find a mute button. Um, so it was budgeting, permitting, and code related. Okay, thank you, permitting. Okay, so let's talk about permitting for a minute. Um, what does an open and transparent permitting process look like? And you might think about that from the vantage point of the applicant. You might also think about this from the vantage point of people that are interested in knowing what's happening and what's going and where. Um, so think about it from multiple angles and describe to us what you think an open and transparent permitting process might look like. Commissioner Chase again. Uh, so I, I, I have not personally worked with the city 
on uh, permitting. But I do have a friend that is trying to open a business right now in the city of Kyle. And his permitting for mm-hmm. his build out within the, within a, a warehouse that he's, he's renting a space in uh, has been pretty bumpy for him. Uh, he didn't understand the process fully. Um, and has it's caused several delays and, and same thing back and forth with the contractor and, and the city on, on what permits are required and what aren't. Uh, so I think it's... Um, a better explanation for, for those customers, and I'll call them customers, for those customers that are coming in because they're not all residents that are coming in to get permitting. It's businesses as well. Um, it's making sure that those customers uh, better understand what's what's required instead of kind of just leaving them hanging and, and them not realizing that their permits are delayed um, for several weeks at a time. Uh, and then from... Mm-hmm. From the code aspect, again, I don't think that's something we do a bad job of. We discuss code, and and this um, uh, the the planning team does a great job of explaining that during these meetings. Uh, so again, it for me it goes to um, just apathy and 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 folks not not under not coming in to understand uh, why we make some of these changes in the code. Mm-hmm. Okay, so to summarize and make sure that I'm capturing everything, it sounds like it's a combination of understanding the process itself, um, the time constraints that are part of that process itself, and then some of the whys behind the regulations and restriction, restrictions. Is that fair to say? Did I miss anything? Yeah, and I think that's more on the on the permitting side for for the building. I mean, on the on the land side for permitting, okay. you have developers that are doing this day in and day out. So, um, you know, they they understand the processes, but someone who's trying to open a small business isn't going to understand that process and and tends to get lost in that. Great point. Absolutely, that may be their one and only experience. So we want that to be positive. Anyone else on the dais have a, a thought about? transparency and openness in permitting or code related functions I agree that there's an issue with permitting on occasion one instance I'm aware of was a uh, uh, older home here in the downtown area being remodeled for a business and it really was uh, quite delayed by the permitting and inspection process Um, I think that it was not clear to them from the beginning Uh, what limitations or possible positive choices they may have have had in the use of that property. And it became quite confusing for them regarding uh, any number of things regarding foundations, sidewalks, uh, signs, the whole uh, project. And what's ironic about this, these are people who work in real estate. So even they ran into some problems. Okay. That's interesting to know. Okay, great. I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of real estate, so to speak, pardon the pun, that we can look at with um, trying to help make that a more open and transparent process. I want to move next um, to something the chairman mentioned about this east-west divide and understanding why things are sided. I'll, I'll phrase it that way: the siding of different developments that are occurring around the community. Um, that tracks with some of the feedback we've received and engagement so far. And so I'm curious what you all would say or suggest um, a more open and transparent approach to the siting of developments um, in different parts of the community could look like. Um, yeah, I, uh, this is Commissioner Guerra. Uh, um, I do believe that, you know, this is an issue, and it's not only just with developments, it's also with uh, road improvements or parks or other okay. th- amenities that may go in. Um, and and the city makes a decision, which I believe they often make the decision that is best for the city as a whole, but a group may feel that they're not being represented well. Um, and, and so I think if, uh, in most situations, if the citizens better understood you know, when it comes to roads, the master road plan, or when it came to uh, just different developments or uh, um, um, amenities that will be coming to the other side of the city as well, it will help 
not pointing mm-hmm. the fingers every time something goes in um, on the other side from them. Okay. So it sounds, inferring from what you're saying, it sounds like an, a more open and transparent approach to that would be something where perhaps um, there's proactive um, communications and facts that are shared um, that ground the discussion and help show the path towards the decisions that are being made. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you for helping me um, capture that. That also sounds like it applies to your point to things like capital improvements and maybe just in general, even um, in just what we would call good governance. So uh, I think there's also a lot of things that we can pull from those comments as well. Um, And then any other thoughts um, from anyone else on the dais as it relates to um, the communications of the whys behind things like capital improvements and other development uh, siding issues? Commissioner Stiegel, I think uh, one of the problems these days happens to be no local means of communication except a monthly newspaper is virtually it. So there has to be a real focus on how to push this information through the media channels. And I think that the city generally does a good Mm -hmm. uh, job of that, but I think that it needs to be reviewed and really, this is ironic and difficult, but how to reach low information citizens who may not be tuned into these things. You know, the, the approach that I have thought of is that people would like to think we're working with them and for them, but not having things happen to mm-hmm. them. And however that can be overcome. I okay. Think. Happening with them and for them and not to them. I really like the wording that you used there. Um, Karina, can we just quote that exactly? I want to come back to that. That's excellent. Any other thoughts? This is Commissioner Chase, just to piggyback on what you said. Um, so there is some legislation going through the state. Uh, I think the bill was filed a couple days ago um, to allow municipalities mm-hmm. to start um, posting for meetings and for hearings uh, through alternate media. Right now they have to post through the newspaper. So they'll be able to, to yes. change that uh, in the future, hopefully, if, if this bill goes through. So. Excellent. I'm glad you brought that up. I think a lot of cities will be watching that legislation very closely, as will we. Okay, and let's go on to the fourth um, issue that was brought up, which was water. Um, When we are talking about that particular issue, and I I believe it was in reference to water shortage or supply or restriction, um, maybe some combination of those three, what does an open and transparent process look like when we're trying to communicate those things to the public? So, Commissioner Onkin here. Um, I've had comments from folks in my community that um, are concerned about this, the rate of growth in Kyle and what that means for their water that's already mm-hmm. being placed under restrictions with the drought this year. Um, I know that when we are given packets to review, it clearly says that the city and the relevant parties have approved it and they can provide water, electricity, whatnot. But um, I don't think the average person understands what that means and what that consists of. Have they done the analysis to you know, feel confident that increasing the growth of the city by 10, 20, 30,000 people over the next five to 10 years is something that can be sustained. I don't think people understand what the decision is being made on as to whether to approve or not approve things. This is another thing that tracks closely with some of the engagement that we've received and feedback. So um, yes, to your point, making sure that people understand maybe what uh, analysis has taken place and why there is a comfort level um, with approving some things, or maybe even what uh, what the options are for the city when they're considering these things. Those do sound like things that the average citizen probably um, would like to hear more about or does not have access to. Um, so I'm curious, uh, would anybody else like to chime in in that regard? 
There are several things regarding this <clears throat> that come to mind. One of which is we've got a major water project coming online quite soon. So we actually will have capacity. Mm -hmm. um, the question is being in Texas, even though it's a reliable source, um, what, uh, what's going to happen in the future regarding not just population growth, but um, drought, for instance. And uh, I think one of the issues here is there's a push and a pull because right now the developers cannot um, complete any kind of landscaping on the pro new properties because of the water restriction. Um, I understand mm -hmm. that, and that is a very real problem right now. On the other hand, I think there's definitely no leadership here in the city and leading the developers to different uh, ways of working this with this via, uh, via xeriscaping and other forms of uh, landscaping. Um, we keep relying on turf, and and we look at our water bills, and you know, 60% or more of it is is irrigation. So there's this kind of problem regarding irrigation, I mean, you know, information in the city as to regard, as regards water usage. Um, and I think that's an important thing to be gotten out there because even with the new water coming online, the problem's not gonna go away. And if we're squandering our water on lawns, mm -hmm. we're not serving anybody well. You bring up a, a point that I think will be an undercurrent of this whole open and transparent principle, which is taking different elements of city building and the average citizen seeing conflict between those and not understanding if those things are being looked at together or if they're simply um, being looked at separately or not at all. So I think that your, your point is well stated. Um, I'm curious as it relates to kind of the, um, the water the push and pull between the water restrictions and development. Um, is there a great deal of knowledge and understanding today, do you think, about what that entails for the average developer? Do you think there's a connection currently between the public understanding the different elements of things that are required in development? This also ties back to the conversation we had earlier about transparency in the permitting process. This is Commissioner Any Siegel again. Um, regarding the water use where I live out, there's been a build out of 74 homes that are all coming to completion or have been completed. And a number of them have been left with uh, uh, dirt lawns covered by erosion mats. And of course, somebody new moving in wonders what happened here. And I don't think that they've gotten very good explanations from the developers. I don't know that the developers have very clear information or take the time to convey it in any case. Um, but I do think it's a real issue for new residents here as to understand exactly what the problem is. And, and actually, maybe um, the developers in some cases being uh, more generous with their landscaping plans rather than making a mandatory Bermuda lawn. Um, I mean, there's really specific issues like that that go on. Okay. Okay, so even an evolution in the way that we're approaching the regulation of those topics could be more open and transparent. And I think that's gonna tie to another principle we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, so great discussion. I think you've already given us a lot of things to chew on. Let me move us on to the next principle, um, which is economic prosperity. And again, with these principles, we understand that, you know, the value, um, the value baked into the word prosperity is different for different people. So understanding that we're not going to reach a universal definition of what that means tonight, let's focus on the types of city decisions where economic prosperity um, would be a principle that could be factored into that. What are a few of those types of decisions that we could um, break into and discuss a little further? Commissioner Chase, um, so I think specifically for this comp plan um, and some form of what we discussed at our, our last meeting about aesthetics, um, architectural standards for, for developers and builders coming in, um, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth right now, so be prepared. Uh, <laughs> on on okay. one end, I think we need to... You need to be, I agree in, in some aspect that you need to be more restrictive in the materials that are 
uh, used for exteriors of home. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to restrict developers so much that they choose not to build in the, the city of Kyle. Um, okay. Would that happen? Probably not. I mean, Kyle's in a great location uh, between between Austin and, and San Antonio, so I, I think you'd still have some developers willing to come in. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. More restrictions slash less restrictions, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, your points will take in, and we'll dig into that a little bit more in a moment. I have a couple of questions about that. Uh, what are some other examples of decisions where economic prosperity for the community would be particularly important to discuss? Commissioner Stiegel, I think that recently considering the downtown uh, plan, um, every bit of it had to do with economic development in the end um, because you're talking about mixed use spaces and all of that and converting properties for different mm -hmm. kinds of commercial use or retail. And uh, I think that um, we you run the risk of being in a situation, build it and they will come. Um, I think there has to be a plan for the land use and f for what the development would look like there. But I do see that for prosperity's sake, a couple of things need to be considered. One, um, the, uh, the uh, collaboration with economic development um, office here would be one particular thing, that they be mm -hmm. a part of, of this, that they at least have their ear to the ground. Um, with that. And the other thing would be a position I would take is that I'm very interested in terms of economic prosperity as about keeping wealth in the community. So for me, prosperity downtown, for instance, would be a lot of local owners. Um, prosperity downtown for me would be, rather than just having apartments, would be having townhomes and condos that could be owned by residents. Mm -hmm. So again, keeping the wealth in the community. So those are a couple of thoughts I have just in regards to downtown. Excellent, thank you so much. Maybe one or two additional types of decisions for us to discuss. Well, uh, when I think of economic prosperity, I think, oh, sorry, this is Commissioner Guerra. Um, I, thank I, you. I, I want to see our businesses succeed because I want for my property taxes to go down and for the businesses to take more of that load, uh, which I think is a problem here in Kyle. I think, I think our property taxes are a bit high because the business community uh, hasn't quite reached its full potential and able to take more of that load from us. And so, um, I, again, talking both sides of my mouth, you know, you almost want to give out more uh, tax incentives for growth, for future ability, for them to take more of that, um, more of that load from the citizens. Okay, thank you. Any final thoughts before we start talking about what these things look like with transparency? Commissioner Onkin, um, so I think all of us probably have different interpretations of what economic prosperity actually means. So I think it would be helpful for one thing for all of us sure. to, um, if this is one of the principles that we decide to move forward with, is make sure we're all aligned on what that means, because then we can agree on what that would look like for decision making. But um, for me, economic yes. prosperity is kind of the household income levels of the city. And um, going back to Commissioner, um, I think, Siegel's point, um, we want to see wealth stay in Kyle with, with people and, and families and businesses here. Um, so city decisions that the principal would apply to would, I guess, relate to how do we attract high-skill businesses, high-earning jobs into Kyle, not just services, not just... I'm a store, I sell things, but services like uh, more white collar workers. We have a lot of bedroom workers who drive into Austin or San Marcos or somewhere else, and then they come home here. They could work here if we could attract businesses to build offices and complexes here or to populate ones that are already being built. So that would be a, 
decision I would think about for economic prosperity. Okay, great. Another excellent example. Well, let's drill into these just a bit. So again, we're looking at kind of examples of, of decisions that uphold this principle or again, another alternate way to look at it is what this really looks like when we do this um, and apply this in our decision making. So the first one that we talked about was kind of the, the building materials and the quality of the built environment. So when we're trying to make decisions about that quality and those materials, with economic prosperity guiding those decisions, what sorts of things are we seeing? What would that look like? This is uh, Commissioner Chase. So for me, I know it was a discussion we had, looking at Will, maybe a year ago when we sat down with council and did that workshop. Maybe that was beginning of this year. Yeah, beginning of the year. Um, we, we discussed it at, at length there. Um, you know, right now we have developments where it's hardy board on three sides. Um, and mm -hmm. it's do we want to start pushing developers to um, increase the type of materials that they're using uh, on their homes uh, to, again, attract those individuals into the, into the city of Kyle? Uh, and to increase our tax base, basically, with, within the city to increase property values. Um, granted, we had a boom during uh, COVID. Um, I think every city was affected by that in, in Central Texas uh, and around the, world, around the country. Um, but yeah, that, that was a discussion point we've had with, with council during a previous workshop of, of um, why we would want to to look at building materials for for builders for home builders mm -hmm. okay and so just to recap and make sure i'm understanding you fully it's both a combination of um, utilizing those materials in a way that creates the value the lasting value um, within the community which is one source of economic prosperity but then your point is also the quality of the way that that building is done attracting um, very targeted groups of people to take up residence in Kyle, and that also lends itself to economic prosperity. Am I summarizing that correctly? Correct. Okay, thank you for clarity um, on that. Excellent. Any other thoughts about how applying the principle of economic prosperity for Kyle ties into these decisions on building? Commissioner Onkin here. Um, yes, ma'am. When I think about um, folks who might want to move to Austin or to Kyle, excuse me, um, I I think that there are a lot of people who want developer built homes, but I think there's also benefit in variety of living conditions and styles. So. Um, I see a lot of developer built areas in Kyle. I don't see a lot of independently owned lots where people can build a home that they want. And that's unattainable for a lot of people. Um, but for folks who wanna do it, I don't know how that they could. So I, I don't want us to focus so much on developers that we also lose sight of individuals who independently wanna build a home. That's my point. Excellent point. Yes, thank you. And actually that kind of ties to the thread that you shared just a moment ago um, when you were talking about multifamily, I'm sorry, uh, I believe it was Commissioner Stiegel perhaps that was talking about um, the ability to own multiple types of housing stock other than the traditional single family home. And so it sounds like these two threads are actually very much uh, aligned and related to one another. So uh, another point that was brought up was the types of city decisions that relate specifically to downtown and the, the phrase of kind of keeping wealth local. So when we're looking at uh, decisions that are related to the downtown environment specifically, um, what do those decisions look like when we are basing them on the principle of economic prosperity?
Commissioner Onkin, you said downtown? Keeping well downtown? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I will build mm -hmm. on um, some comments I had at a meeting around our downtown master plan. I want us to make sure that in downtown Carl, okay. we are not focused so much on building um, big like block size buildings that only developers are able to afford to purchase that land and build those properties because then we don't have yes. um, as many people here who own that space and then can later sell it when they want to retire or whatever they need to do. If all they do is lease, 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 and all that money is going to developers, and if the developer sells, the money goes with them, I don't think that's building prosperity for Kyle. Great point. So the notion of prosperity here is also tied to some of the smaller, more what we call incremental uh, types of building stock and um, things that are attainable for locals that um, are invested in the community and want to be part of it long term. I think that was something that actually came up in our first work session with you all as well. So I think that that's an important point that we'll drill down on further. Um, another thing that was shared was talking about incentivizing, I'll use that term in its strictest definition, not specifically related to funding, but incentivizing uh, businesses to locate in Kyle to help relieve tax burden. So what are some different types of decisions that could be made with that in mind um, under this umbrella of economic prosperity? Um, uh, Commissioner Guerra, um, so I think, yes, from, for, from what we've already been talking about as well with, you know, encouraging people to be uh, business owners and property owners here in our own community, uh, incentivizing, sm incentivizing small business, but as well as larger businesses on a, you know, a, you know, a, a scaled thing uh, could help both grow here and here in Kyle we, you know uh, 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 we do want locally owned businesses we also want larger businesses that can provide those higher paying jobs uh, that are that are needed here as well and so uh, I think incentivizing both the larger and smaller businesses uh, will hopefully attract some of each okay so perhaps in considering these types of decisions as a city there might be some key questions that are asked to determine if it really upholds this principle of economic prosperity. And perhaps to your point, one of those questions might be, does this decision in fact achieve a goal of diversifying um, or adding to the diversity of different businesses uh, in terms of size, scale, and ownership in Kyle? Is that um, in line with your way of thinking of that? Right. Yes. And, and the, um, jobs that it, it you know, uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the level of, you know, uh, uh, jobs that it would provide as well. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Excellent. Any other thoughts about, um, maybe questions that could be asked, um, that lend itself to ensuring these decisions we're talking about, in fact, uphold this ideal or principle of economic prosperity? So, Commissioner Chase, just to, just to build on uh, the chair's comments, uh, things like, you know, uh, grants for small businesses through the city, um, just different incentives mm -hmm. to, to bring them in, uh, doesn't always have to be a tax base incentive. Um, to encourage okay. local homeowners to, to also become local business owners or vice versa, um, which I think is, is great. But at the same time, I think it was mentioned twice, is bringing in um, uh, some more white collar type, type jobs. Um, I think we've been great mm -hmm. at getting manufacturing and, and warehousing and, um, and those types of hubs in the city. Um, but I don't, I don't know of a, an office building other than like a single story, maybe within a, one of the strips or something um, within the, the city that doesn't have a warehouse attached to it. 
uh, or some type of storage attached to it. I'm, okay. I'm trying to think of that. So I think it's encouraging uh, that type of development. And understanding that type of development can be modern. So it's not, you know, it's not something that would be downtown or anything like that. Um, but encouraging mm -hmm. those, those type of uh, uh, job creators to, to come into the city as well. I liked the phrase that you used about um, essentially asking the question, does this decision um, help local homeowners also become local business owners or vice versa? Um, Karina, I wanna make sure we got that to you. That was a really good quote. Okay, excellent. Another thing that was goal? shared um, just a moment ago. Oh, yes, please. No, I was just going to uh, sort of piggyback on th these comments. Of the prosperity is income and wealth, and I would like to see indeed the uh, uh, more commercial development for professional office space. And I do know of one multi-story building in town, uh, but only one that could be used that way. Um, so uh, it would be very much uh, a benefit to increase salary base as well as wealth. And I think we do need to, to mm -hmm. create the physical space to uh, make this inviting for people, both in terms of their housing and in terms of where they work. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much. I think we're going to be able to generate some really good cues for decision making um, along this one, especially. The last one that was mentioned was decisions that attract larger employers and services. Um, so let's uh, park on that one for just a moment. What are some examples of decisions um, that really place economic prosperity at the center um, and result in attracting those larger employers and services? Commissioner Stiegel, um, being in Central Texas and a suburb of Austin, you'd have to qualify what a bigger employer is. Um, you we're not going to have a Samsung mm -hmm. plant in Kyle, for sure. Um, but at least in terms of regional players um, or other national firms that don't require the space of a Google, a Tesla, Samsung, and so forth, we would have to look at what may be called, I don't know, secondary or second tier kinds of major employers or national uh, corporations. Uh, we have to be realistic about our, our, our physical limits here as, as part of this picture. Mm -hmm. So big employer, that's, that's an open question in my mind. Yes, okay, so very similar um, to the commissioner's comments about defining prosperity. Also, it sounds like we would need to be very clear and what we're talking about when we uh, use a term like larger employer. So that uh, also gives us some homework to do. Excellent. Okay, Miss, well, let's move on to the next. I'm oh, going to jump in the, real I think quick. there's a little bit of a delay, so yes. please. Yes, there is. Uh, this is Commissioner Onkin. I do want to raise um, yes, just a concern um, around how we okay. do attract employers, and this also touches a bit on incentivizing businesses. Um, I believe that in the state of Texas for several decades, there's been something called the Chapter 313, which um, allowed cities to incentivize businesses by means of um, tax breaks. And I think it was through um, like education tax breaks or something. I don't know. It was, it was sunsetting this year, at the end of 2022, it's sunsetting. That tool will be gone for cities, and that's been a driver of a lot of the growth in Austin over the last year. I know my employer, um, they were really considering, you know, should we expand our business? Should we build a new factory? Should we do this? Should we do this before this thing expires? So we're going to have to get creative, is my concern, about how we do this now, because that tool is taken away, and that was a thing that um, a lot of larger companies really relied on to sweeten the deal and uh, make their decisions. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Okay, let's talk for a moment about the principle of fiscal responsibility. So as we think about this, and of course a lot of the data and mapping that we're putting together for you is going to help frame this conversation in some way and clarify it. 
But first we want to um, understand for you all, when we talk about a city that prides itself on being fiscally responsible, what are some examples of the different city decisions uh, where that could be illustrated? Um, obviously budgetary is the first one that comes to mind and we can talk about that as well, but are there other types of decisions uh, where a city that prides itself on being fiscally responsible would be able to apply that principle? Commissioner Stiegel, actually, as far as I am aware, um, Public Works Department has done some things that I think were uh, quite thoughtful um, fiscally. It required some money up front, but nevertheless, uh, seems to be saving money along the way. Specifically, I'm referring to road building equipment that would allow them to actually repave roads of some, some length without having to go through a bidding process or bringing in a contractor and paying higher prices. So I think that that was a very good decision. Um, and I think the Public Works Department probably, um, as far as I can tell, um, is fiscally responsible in that regard. And it's, it's actually was a pleasure to see their work and what they're doing. Okay, great. So that's a good example of maybe asking some questions and decision making of things like, what is the most efficient way to accomplish this task? Um, are there cost savings in doing it ourselves versus doing it uh, through a third party? Um, so that's a great example. Anyone else have any examples of a city uh, type of decision making where being fiscally responsible would be very important? Commissioner Stiegel again. I, I don't have the fiscal expertise by far to, to wade into this very far, but when there are tax incentives provided for businesses um, that involve some years of commitment, I'm very concerned that the build out that the city's paying for actually gets some real return over time because there's maintenance that frequently, I'm wondering if it really is uh, uh, um, featured as part of the calculation about what the, what the maintenance, what the inflation rate on maintenance would be, what, um, um, and, and the fact that being quite honest, we used it, we have disposable businesses oftentimes in this country where you see a building that's up and running even by a national firm and it, it's in business for 30, 40 years at the most and it's torn down. And we've paid for the infrastructure for that. And now it's sitting there for what? You know, minimal tax generation. So I really have concerns about the uh, fiscal responsibility in that regard, rather re really piecing out what the tax incentives are and being very clear about what, what really is the payoff. Because I think that there may be hidden costs that we often don't consider. Okay. Excellent. Any other thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, any of the other commissioners about a type of decision where fiscal responsibility is particularly important? Uh, this is Commissioner Guerra. Uh, um, I think I think something that, that's okay. close to what we do wh when it comes to zoning um, can be a fiscally responsible decision or not for the city as well. I think uh, uh, um, zonings mm -hmm. or, or how the city grows, you know, um, a road will cost the same in front of you know, uh, zoned houses that are very spread apart or not. Um, um, so the amenities and the things that the city is providing uh, based on how we zone and how, how either how spread out we are or how, um, uh, how dense something may be is a fiscally responsible question. Excellent. That's one that we, we talk about a lot at Virginity, so we'll definitely touch on that one in a moment. And I wanna make sure I pause for a moment. I know we have a commissioner joining us by phone. I, I just want to make sure that I'm including um, any comments that he would like to share as it relates to this discussion on fiscal responsibility and decisions. Okay, we'll, we'll continue to move, but please feel free to jump in and interject. Okay, um, and before we wrap this one up, any other decision types that you'd like to throw out for consideration for us to talk about here in just a moment? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, let's take these. These are very hefty um, decisions. So let's talk about these for a moment. So the first one was just kind of talking about the, the methods, the different opportunities to offer services or perform improvements within the community. So as we drill into the second question, um, kind of examples of decisions or examples perhaps of questions that we could ask in making decisions that uphold this principle, um, any thoughts as to um, a specific example or um, the sort of analysis, if you will, that could be factored into these? I think one good example that was given was just the very specific example of um, being able to invest in equipment to perform something um, on your own versus farming that out, if you will, to a, another entity or party. Is there another example like that that would be um, helpful for us to keep in mind as we try to provide guidance? I think there's a lot of thinking. This is Commissioner Chase. There's a lot of thinking going on here. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. I know you can't I'll see us, so I wanted to make sure yeah, that you knew we weren't just all asleep over here. That's very helpful. <laughs> no, that's very helpful. You at least let me know the video didn't freeze, which is what I was afraid of. Yeah. No, take your time, please. Yeah. Commissioner Stiegel, uh, speaking just the idea of fiscal responsibility, something I've observed. Um, closely mm -hmm. is how lean the city runs its departments, which has its, uh, its upside downside to it. But I think that there is a fiscal responsibility generally here to paying attention to these kinds of issues. I think it's always uh, on the knife's edge, you know, are you running a little too lean um, for a growing city? But I think there is this quality of fiscal responsibility here. Um, I think what happens though with the tax burden we have that people get confused about how much money is really being spent on city services. And um, um, mm -hmm. so they don't understand that the city runs lean, that the departments run lean, that the management runs lean. They don't understand that. What they do see is their utility bill. So, so in terms of fiscal mm -hmm. responsibility, again, this is about communication and partly about water is the idea of what are we getting for our money? We're paying high taxes and high utility bills. And it, people do not believe that this city runs as lean as it does in its various departments. I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lots of good things packed into that response. So it, it does tie back to um, the earlier principle of open and transparent, making sure people, to your point, understand what they're paying for, what they're getting for that. Um, and I also like the point that you made about, you know, just because a decision maybe seems fiscally prudent today in the long term, does that really um, also equate being fiscally responsible? And so that's another, I think, important uh, distinction that we can maybe come up with some clarifying questions to help uncover in the decision making process. So I think that was very well put. Any other thoughts uh, on that one before we move move on forward? Uh, this is Commissioner Guerra. I I do think that mm -hmm. that, that that the road um, uh, the, the road example is a good one of us willing to spend money now as to not have to you know as to save money in the future. That that is a perfect example. Something that we should try to do more. Um, there have been times our city has done kind of the opposite. Uh, we've we've needed to increase. Uh, wastewater and water rates, but we didn't, and we kind of kicked the can down the road. And I think it kind of, and I think it hurt us in the long run. And so um, I think we need to be willing to make harder decisions now for the betterment of the future, rather than make the easy choice now and pay for it later. Well put. Well put. Excellent. Any other thoughts from the group? Okay. 
Um, well, the next kind of decision that was brought up under this umbrella of fiscally responsible was this um, kind of discussion about tax incentives and the ultimate payout or gain slash loss from making those decisions. So um, are there any perhaps specific questions that you think would be important for decision makers to ask when they're considering that? Um, and are there any other examples like that that you'd like to share? Commissioner Stiegel, I, I'm totally naive about these issues other than to know that they're of concern. I don't know details that I could elaborate on for sure, but when I read a plan for development, I understand it's, it's just business mm -hmm. and it's well understood, but there's a comment on the plan that this will be a, um, a uh, rebatable or um, item that the city will pay us for. Um, I, w I want to make sure that the people uh, understand that we are paying for infrastructure. We do have an investment, and in my view, like any other investment, you need not, not just a return of having people in the houses, because that's one issue, but with the businesses in particular, the infrastructure can be enormous for a particular large box store, and I don't think that that's often understood. The uh, traffic flows, the all of that, let alone the water, the wastewater, and so forth, um, can be a considerable expenditure. So I, I really just think it, the, the accounting has to be done on that. I think we can be, any city can be willing to give tax abatements and so forth now to get somebody to come, but what's the real cost over time? And I'm not, not sure that that's always accounted okay. for in my, my experience. That's a great way to, to sum it up is what's the cost over time, yes. Okay, so a more um, complete evaluation of that is an important one. Another discussion that um, was brought up was the need to discuss the principle of being fiscally responsible as it relates to zoning and land use decisions. And so uh, again, that's, that's kind of in our wheelhouse. So we'll resist the urge to, to talk about it on our own too much, but I'm curious to hear from all of you, um, what are some perhaps examples of decisions where this would be a particularly important speaking point um, or are there any specific questions that you think should be part of that discussion um, to make sure that they are fiscally responsible decisions? Commissioner Onkin. Um, so one of the concerns that I raised when I, I don't know, talked to the council at the meeting where I um, applied to do this was about um, how much does it cost for the city to maintain something over its, not just its one life cycle, but it, over its useful life. So, um, mm -hmm. and right now the words are escaping me uh, for how I phrased it, but basically in business, we have to make decisions around, can we afford to do this in the long haul? How much money is it gonna make us? How much money is it going to cost us? And that balance I think is missing um, from decisions that we make as a council the inf or commission, the information available to us isn't there about, okay, well, if we rezone this to such and such for this potential use, what could it bring in for the city? Because that's important. The city has to make money, but also what is it going to cost the city to maintain it? Not just five years from now, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, uh, the roads is a favorite example. So the roads, from what I understand in Kyle, last about, I don't know, 10 to 20 years, and they have to be resurfaced throughout that period a couple of times. So the cost to resurface it, how much is that? The cost to redo it, how much is that? How much money is each building, whether it's a home or a business or something, how much is that generating for the city? Does it ever even generate enough money to cover the cost of it? And from... Uh, mm -hmm. my limited understanding of this is the answer is generally no, and then it snowballs from there, because if we're doing this everywhere at the same time in a place and in a country, how long does that last before it kind of falls apart, and then how do we pay yes. for it? 
Great, excellent questions and um, very much something that's going to tie to the fiscal analysis work that we're doing uh, for you all as part of this plan. And so you'll be hearing a lot more discussion about these types of questions as we move forward. And I'm glad to hear that you're already on that track of, of thinking. It's gonna be very helpful, I think you'll find. Okay, I'm gonna move us on to the next principle, um, which was equity and justice. Uh, again, these are, are terms that are going to have different meanings to different people, different audiences. Um, but for the purposes of our discussion tonight and to keep us moving along fairly swiftly, um, what are a few examples of city decisions that are made and just general types of city decisions where equity and justice would need to be factored into those decisions? Um, items such as public transportation um, or other amenities that would be available to people that would, um, yes, those who are not necessarily the loudest voice or, or always the most active still need their city to be um, able to serve them. Mm -hmm. Transportation is a great example of that. Any other examples besides transportation where we think we really need to uh, apply this principle? Commissioner Stiegel, um, parks and recreation. Um, we have a very large park complex here on the right. west side and that serves people well and there's gonna be an addition to it, a new addition soon I hear. Uh, but in any case, um, the Lake Kyle uh, could be built out and I think there could be smaller parks perhaps on the east side that could make a difference. Um, green space does make a difference. So I think that would be uh, uh, one example. Um, something I mm -hmm. have heard in this community just by way of other people's experience and opinions is that on the east side we may get um, retail, but it's east side Walmart. It's just on the I-35 overlay. There's not very much commercial that is uh, useful for many of the residents out further out on the east side. And I think one way we can impact that through our planning is looking at the local nodes and the regional nodes and really being sure that those commercial uh, corridors or sites can really serve the population. I think that's one thing we can pay attention to on the PNZ. Okay, great. So it sounds like with both of those things, transportation and parks and open space, um, what you're really talking about is things like access, proximity, and connection. Um, so I think those are excellent points. And I, are there any other examples of decisions where those elements um, are also critical? This is Commissioner Chase. I, I, I'd like to add, and I think this may have been missed um, in, in what he was just saying, is also that the east-west side, I think, is kind of, where he was alluding to and with the commercial on the the east side mm -hmm. and that's kind of where your your equity uh, comes in is is um, making sure that we're zoning on on that side so i think he had he had two points uh within that okay. same his same statement there so i just wanted to make sure that that was captured as well it wasn't just parks but it was also making sure we're, we're equitably split, splitting and 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 zoning commercial on the east side as well yes okay so allocation in a sense is is another element of that yes thank you for that i did overlook it any other decision types that we could factor into this Here's one that hasn't um, been brought up yet. I'm curious your thoughts on this as it relates to housing decisions. Question from Commissioner Onkin. Uh, jumping the gun a little bit. Yes, ma'am. When I did this last week, wasn't there um, a question about neighborhoods for all? 
or a principle about neighborhoods for all. That is also one of the principles. So can you, can you kind of distinguish between what you mean by housing for people versus the neighborhoods for all? Because to me, that was the, that's what we had meant with neighborhoods for all. So maybe I misread that. No, that's fine. It's, I mean, again, it's open to interpretation. And so that is um, consistent with, I think, a way that a lot of people would look at that. Um, and so, you know, equity and justice um, could also factor in, um, in into this element as it relates to things like access to housing. And so we might think of that when we think about neighborhoods for all as um, access to a diversity of housing types and therefore price points. Um, and so here, that would also be very closely aligned, but we might also think about that in terms of um, just being able to have uh, perhaps this, the kinds of conditions of housing um, that we think about when we think about uh, rentals, that that's one element where we've seen communities apply equity and justice to housing in addition to thinking about neighborhoods for all. So there is no right or wrong answer. Um, I just throw that out because that's one that usually comes up when we when we talk about equity and justice, but we can certainly save that and put a pin in that for when we get to uh, neighborhoods for all. Okay, I will move us on. And as you can see, the more that you start going through this thought process, you start kind of integrating these two questions together in the way that you're thinking. And so as you're giving us examples, you're already intuitively um, talking about how those decisions could be made. So you're you're doing this very nicely, um, and that's exactly what the point of the exercise is. So I think we'll move a little more quickly through the remainder of these. Let's talk for a moment about public health and safety, um, the types of city decisions where this could be applied, and maybe some examples um, where this principle could be upheld in decision making. This is usually the one that comes pretty intuitively. So. Um, let me know your thoughts on this one, please. Uh, Commissioner Chase, so I'm just going to rattle off off a few uh, to kind of help please. stimulate some conversation here. Uh, so, just in in your in your um, public safety as a whole, uh, so your uh, your services, police and fire. Um, making sure they're adequate size and uh, adequately equipped for the size of the city. Um, uh, hospital network, uh, making sure you have uh, um, health available within, within the city. And um, your transportation, uh, how your streets are laid out, um, your speed limits, your stop signs, your signals, um, uh, strategically placing those in areas. Uh, my favorite roundabouts. I, I like roundabouts personally. Um, we have a lot of them in the city, and we're probably going to put more from from what I keep hearing. So um, those are five or six. I, I stopped counting there, but uh, those are a few. No, great list, and I think that that's yeah, that's a great list. Would anyone else like to add any additional kinds of decisions? I'm gonna, this is Commissioner Onkin. I'm gonna throw out um, bike lanes. It's uh, something that needs to okay. be safe and it will also be something people use as a public health measure to um, do their fitness. Yes. Great point, very dual, dual focus. Any others? Commissioner Stiegel, we have a fairly complex first responder system in Kyle that is involves an emergency mm -hmm. services district and, and so on and so forth. And I think they generally coordinate things well, but that's where with the growth, I would want to be confident that they are all on the same page because I know they're all working shorthanded. So that means they've got to work 
efficiently and with communication as to how they apply their resources. So that coordination is uh, of concern for me. Um, okay. That's a great one that we probably wouldn't have thought of not having the local context. So thank you for that. Okay, any other thoughts on this one before we move forward? Okay. Next, uh, let's talk about the principle of community partnerships. What are some types of city decisions where partnerships within the community are especially important? Commissioner Chase, um, so a couple that, that I can think of is, is working with interest and activist groups within uh, the community. Um, it's holding meetings like this, these, these workshops, where uh, citizens can hear the comments and we can hear citizen comments and, and we can uh, discuss them. Um, some of those comments more openly during these these workshop uh, uh, type meetings, um, and I think this also includes the partnership with the city and uh, the local school districts, um, the city and and uh, local businesses as well, um, in in working with them to to. Um, Lost my train of thought there. Um, I'll just end with just just working with local businesses on on uh, maybe even promoting the 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 business and and having um, events in their area. I'm I'm kind of thinking more about downtown specifically. I, I don't think that the city okay. is going to partner with Walmart and throw um, you know a, a, an event out there, but thinking more downtown. Uh, partnering with the, with the small businesses downtown here. Okay, great examples, thank you. Anyone else like to contribute? Uh, Commissioner Stiegel, I think that the city we're living in is growing so fast, coming from a, about 5,000 people up to perhaps 52,000 in 15 years or something like that. There aren't a lot of volunteer organizations here yet but I think that we need to have our radar up and running to see uh, what is going on in the community so that we really do stay in touch with these volunteer organizations. One that cropped up here that the city's very supportive of, um, very supportive, is the, the seniors in this town have a real active voice in the government, have the senior zone, which is supported by the uh, facility, supported by the city. Um, they've donated land for a um, facility, the funds to be raised by the seniors and interested parties. So I think that that's an example of a community partnership. Um, but again, we don't have that many civic groups here that I'm aware of. When you think of community partnership, um, right off the top of my head, the first one that will always come to mind is the Chamber of Commerce. And I think that that uh, is understand. While it's understandable, um, I think we need to have as many voices as we can have. I would agree that we need to probably have meetings out in the community more often about some of these things. And recently, was most concerned that regarding the community downtown plan, I, I there were 16 residences affected by the plan that would be, and other businesses. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that they were canvassed or somehow connected with in a way that they were in part of the process having the most skin in the game in terms of direct costs to them. And so that's another way of partnering, I think, with just citizens. Um, again, with this idea of things not happening to people. Um, yes. So that, that's one level of, of outreach, I think. Excellent, thank you so much.
any final thoughts about community partnerships? I realize we've been at this a while, so we'll start moving a little more swiftly um, to be mindful of your time, but I wanna make sure I give you every effort to, or every uh, opportunity rather to weigh in. Okay. All right, well, next up is the uh, aforementioned Neighborhoods for Everyone. And so uh, we would be anxious to hear some of your thoughts uh, about how this would apply, what types of city decisions and opportunities does the city have to in fact, make sure that there are neighborhoods for everyone. They're looking at me, so I guess I have to talk. Um, this is Commissioner Ogden. <laughs> um, I, I yes, think this is very important. Um, as far as the types of city decisions the principle applies to, to me this would mean um, very much easing restrictions or considering, I guess, making a decision about easing restrictions on um, housing zoning. Um, there, Okay. There's a lot of different types of housing zoning levels that the city has, and I'm sure they have reasons for the, the nuances of it. Um, but referencing what I said earlier, at least in the area where I live, the only stuff that's being built that is um, like a single family home that's not a developer built is old. There's nothing new um, like that uh, outside of the historic downtown area. So I think if you want a neighborhood for everyone, you have to let people build what the market wants. And if we mm -hmm. have too many restrictions or too many rules around that, it limits people if they want to build something small. You know, not everybody needs a 3,000 square foot house. Some people might want, a, a, what are they called? A, the mini homes, the small homes? Tiny, tiny homes. Somebody might want a tiny home. Oh, the home tiny and, homes? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe there's areas where they could do that, but it's not in an area where they feel safe or they would have access to services or the lifestyle amenities that they want. And so um, I'm a bit libertarian on this one. I would want the city to take that into consideration. Okay. Excellent and great examples of that. Uh, this is Commissioner Chase. Any other thoughts? So... Okay. Um, and I think it's it's definitely more market driven, but we've I think I've at least talked blue in the face about more condos in this community um in the city of Kyle um, mm -hmm. I think we we have some coming there's a pretty i think that development i don't know if that's single family or if that's the one that city council just or that uh, council was bringing back to to revote on with the parking issue. Um, but I don't, we don't really have, uh, too many condos in this community. Um, and I think it's, again, uh, I, I, I get Commissioner Onkin's, um, concern about developers and, and, and wanting, um, uh, more individualism, but it's, again, working with developers and saying, Hey, we, we, we need to see a mix in your development. You know, we don't. We don't want to just see um, three-sided hardy board homes in the entire community, and, and that's all you're doing. We want to see a mix um, because I think that is a gap that we're missing in in the city. You go from an apartment to a house, uh, but there's nothing in between there. Um, so when you talk about neighborhoods for everyone, it's having all of those different elements within that within those different community or different neighborhoods throughout the community. Uh, everything from, even if it's single family for rent, but having some type of rental aspect, some type of uh, condo, um, either detached, attached, townhome, um, stacked flats, um, and then single family uh, along with it. Well said. Thank you so much for that. Commissioner Stiegel, uh, types of decisions that this principle apply to, neighborhoods for everyone, what I'm very interested in is green space. 
And what I see oftentimes, mm -hmm. I, I understand the principles. There's a drainage problems in central Texas, so you need retention ponds and so forth. But I have an issue where the green space in the community winds up being retention ponds um, or some sort of drainage area that cannot, is not suitable for other uses, really. Um, there's one notable example okay. of that uh, in one subdivision where there's a lot of open space. There's a permanent water space there, uh, a natural now a natural water area, but it um, it's not otherwise very usable other than for walking around it. There's not enough flat space for a kid to play a pickup game of baseball or something, and um, maybe that's asking too mm -hmm. much. But I do know that it, you know in a so car society is dominated by cars. It's good to have space to walk around in safely, and if that's in your own community, your own neighborhood. I think that would be uh, preferable. That makes a lot of sense. And that also keys back into the public health and safety aspect that we talked about a moment ago. So a lot of these are very integrated. Okay, uh, next let's talk about the principle of innovation and new ideas. Uh, where are some elements of decision-making in cities where innovation and new ideas could be upheld as a standard or principle and what are perhaps some examples it's commissioner chase so i'm gonna throw will and his team a, a bone here uh the vibe trail i think is an innovative and new idea for especially for the city of kyle Great example. um i think incorporating that is an extremely intelligent way to to uh, reduce our vehicles within the community, but also interconnect all the neighborhoods within Kyle. I, I, I think it's, that is a perfect example and a type of, of decision from city council to, to go along with, with this, uh, with the Vibe Trail. Commissioner Onkin, uh, the last couple of years have been mm -hmm quite transformative, I would say, for a lot of people as um, they dealt with changes from the pandemic. And I think that a, a type of city decision that the principal could apply to might relate to how we um, require the use of space. So um, for, I don't know, what's a good example of this? I was thinking about um, parking spaces was, was one thing. Um, if we're wanting to build places where more people stay and they don't drive to, to work anymore, they either work locally or um, work from home or something like that, do we really need as much parking as we needed three, four, or five years ago? Is that a trend that we think will stay and we can maybe work that into a code? And also, can we zone our communities in a way where we can encourage and incentivize that um, to, to use alternative methods of transportation like the Vibe Trail or something, but the Vibe Trail um, on steroids where we don't have to maybe go a mile or two miles to get something to eat or to go meet up with friends, but where we can go somewhere in our community and use our feet. Great example. So it sounds like that would be, um, all of those would be examples of places where decision makers could ask questions about, does this decision in fact make room or space for new ideas and innovative approaches? So I think those are great examples. Um, any other parting thoughts on this one? Any other examples that you'd like to share? Commissioner Stiegel, I would second what uh, Commissioner Chase said. Kudos to the planning department. Uh, the Vibe Trail, I think is, uh, a, a great benefit to the community. The concern is that um, people really understand the vision of the, the Vibe Trail, especially the developers, and that amenities that are spoken of will actually be created along the Vibe Trail. I see it as an opportunity to connect Kyle in a particular kind of way where there can be very local or neighborhood destinations that you can travel from one neighborhood to the next. I mean, really, that's part of the idea. Um, but I would really like to see that this not just be a good idea where, frankly, the developers or other persons involved 
look, look at this as, well, this is just a trailer, we, a sidewalk we create around the perimeter of our property to make the city happy. It's about more than that. It's about creation of space for the citizens. And um, so bringing that mm -hmm. to the fore, keeping that up front, um, the idea of the vibe trail should not be neglected in my, in my opinion. Excellent, thank you for that. Any other insights before we move to the next category? Okay, we're getting close, I promise. So up next is data driven. Uh, what are some types and examples of city decisions that can be uh, driven by data that is generated or collected? Commissioner Chase, uh, this, what we're doing now, the comp plan. Mm -hmm. This is Commissioner Onkin. I think this one ties a lot in with fiscal responsibility. Uh, you can't make decisions it on does. what you don't know. Or you could, but they'd probably be wrong. Very true. Any types of city decisions where you think um, particularly that data is maybe playing less of a role than it could be that we should um, encourage the city and the community to really pull more data into those decisions? So from a comp plan perspective, oh, this is Commissioner Onkin. From a comp plan perspective, yes. I think it would be interesting to look outside of Kyle um, at some cities that we think are very successful, you know, things we want to be and cities that we don't want to be, and to look at maybe their comp plans or their ordinances and see what environment created this, you know, what were the... What were the ripple effects? Where did they start with? What were, where were they trying to go? And what went wrong? And then use that information to shape our own plan. Love that. That's a great one. Anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Uh, regarding data. Or on the a, use of data? Yes. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that one section of the town was developed residential. There's a commercial to go in, but it was developed residentially as being developed. Um, that is really quite close to a cement plant. And for me, what's quantitative or data driven is what's the health risk? Because it can be one thing to have commercial services available 10 or 12 hours a day, but it's something else for people to live in that corridor. So I, I don't think that's too much to ask is to uh, take a look at those kind of health and safety practices in a data-driven kind of way. Uh, what's, what's the data from the state, from the HPA? Um, you know, not this particular plant, but that company has had problems at other sites and been sanctioned by the EPA. I would like to know if, if that particular plant's being a good citizen and if it's something we literally can live with. Thank you for that. Um, this is Commissioner Garrett. I think a lot of times cities make decision based on desired outcome. You know, they want for to help people. They want to do something positive, but uh, but looking at the desired outcome instead of the actual thing that is happening or the thing that you are doing will oftentimes lead to unintended consequences. So I think a lot of decisions that are made by cities that where they actually do look back on it and have those unintended consequences is because they were focused on the desired outcome and not the data or backing up as to what it is they are actually going to do. Great point. I think we can all think of examples that fall into that area. Okay, any final thoughts on this one? I think you've given us a great list.
Okay. Um, the last one is culture and history. Um, what types of decisions would enable city decision makers to factor in um, kind of the protection or upholding of culture and history? Commissioner Chase, um, I'm not sure how, how aware y'all are about that downtown master plan that we reviewed a, a few weeks ago. Um, if you didn't get a chance to catch our three and a half, four hour meeting, it, it was a barn burner. Uh, you should check it out. But I think that was a big miss on uh, the culture and history of Kyle. Um, so it's the uh, and that that's a good example of the city making this decision not to move forward with that plan and to send it back and and ask for for changes to protect the culture and history of of uh, downtown kyle so sometimes inaction is i will let you know that i was just going to say sometimes inaction is 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 a good action for towards culture and history um and, and not approving something that doesn't work for for that area. Excellent point. I will let you know that we, um, your staff has provided us with a copy of the most recent draft. And so we um, have begun looking at that this week. And thank you for referencing that meeting. We will work with Will to um, see if we can take a look at that recording. I think that would be very helpful for us to watch. So thank you for referencing that. Any other thoughts relating to the principle of upholding culture and history in the city decision-making? Commissioner Stiegel, I think in culture, um, sometimes we tend to look backwards. Um, thinking of culture that we've inherited versus culture that we're developing now. And um, I know just by happenstance, uh, fortunate uh, events and bright people innovating. Um, Lockhart, uh, a nearby community, is developing quite a few businesses. But one of the things that's happening there, it's becoming more of a center for, for music. And being in close proximity to both Austin and then the movie industry in San Marcos, Bastrop, and elsewhere, I would really think that we could be do some brainstorming about what culture means now, about what's available to us to enjoy, but also what's there available to us to take advantage of in terms of business opportunities. Um, a movie was shot here recently on Center Street. Um, money was spent in this town. Um, that's culture too, but it's also business, of course. So I, I'm, I'm I know Catherine Ann Porter's house is here, and somebody recently, when I told them where I'm living now, said, oh, yeah, that's Catherine Ann Porter's town. Right. We, we can appreciate that and preserve those things and publicize it, but I'd like to hear more thought about culture today in our own living experience. Excellent point. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's important for us to understand and dig a little deeper on. This is Commissioner Onkin. Any other thoughts anyone would like to share? Yes, ma'am. So my understanding of Kyle from a few decades ago, before my time, was that it was a, a agricultural area and it's also Central Texas area. So I wanna um, kind of make sure that city decisions, or I think it would benefit the city if we made decisions to, to not completely stamp out those things. Commissioner Stiegel, I had the thought that then um, something that we've heard at least twice tonight is a train going by, and it's something we complain about. Um, it's something we tune out, that we live with every day on uh, the central part of the town. Uh, we really don't look at this community as, as having had a contribution by a railroad, except for the old railroad facility here. 
there might be some real irony, but f even fun and innovation around making the railroad something of the character of the town. I mean, it's so obvious, it's on the tip of your nose, but it might be something we could do regarding culture and history. The reason I bring that up, I was in a location last week as well where there was an abandoned railroad, admittedly, but actually they dressed up this very nice downtown, a small downtown, around the, the train being one element of that city and um, put in some very nice architectural details related to railroad. And so I think that um, that's something else we can look at too because we, we look at the railroad as noise and a traffic stopper, but maybe we could think through this a little bit differently, make it an asset of a different kind. Thank you for, for walking through that with us. I think just the different perspectives you've given us of culture um, will give us many things that we can certainly put together. Any last thoughts on this one? Okay, well, congratulations. <laughs> you made it to the end. Um, this is probably everyone's favorite slide because it lets you know that you are um, at the conclusion of our discussion. So what happens next? Uh, you've given us tons of great insights on all of these different principles, and you've kind of given us some sneak peeks into the elements that you find particularly important. So we're going to um, work through and compile all of the notes that we've taken from this discussion tonight. In fact, I'll probably go back and watch this discussion a couple more times just to make sure we capture everything and uh, really reflect on what you've said. And then I think we'll work with the staff to um, reach out to you um, in the weeks to come and perhaps allow you to take a, a look at what we've come up with in terms of capturing your thoughts and help us make sure that we haven't overlooked anything. Um, we again will be using these and pairing them with the public feedback that we get in survey two, which again is going to open up uh, right after the first of the year and will run into mid February. And combining these things and marrying them together will enable us to uh, refine this list down to um, a few principles that particularly um, seemed to resonate with Kyle. And we will use those in the section of the plan where we talk about long-term decisions and the execution and implementation of the plan. And so you've been very helpful in helping us understand kind of the uh, temperature of the community as it relates to these areas and some of the different ways that you'd like us to work these principles in. Um, so speaking on behalf of our team, I think we've found it very helpful. Um, thank you for sticking with it. As you saw, after we work through the first couple and you really break these down into pieces, um, it becomes a very intuitive process. And so that's our hope is that in putting this planning document together, we are able to help your decision makers both now and in the future and Kyle um, intuitively work through a very organized process of decision making where they're able to demonstrate to the public how they're taking these principles that really resonated there in Kyle and applying them to all of the different types of decisions that they're facing and that they're making. And to your point, um, just a few moments ago, sometimes choosing not to take action on as well as a, as a form of decision. So thank you all so much for your time, um, your investment, your attention and your ideas. And with that, I will hand it back um, to Will to wrap us up. Thank you, AJ and your team uh, for all the help you've had tonight and uh, leading the discussion on the comp plan. All right. Actually, okay. I'll back to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We will move on. That was item number seven. We'll move on to item number eight. General discussion, 8A, discussion only regarding Planning and Zoning Commission requests for future agenda items. Are there any commissioners who have any items you would like to see on a future agenda? Okay, we will move on. Item number nine, staff report. 
Uh, 9A, staff report by William Atkinson, Director of Planning. All right. So um, just a couple things. So I do not intend to meet on the 27th of this month. Um, unless uh, y'all just really have a hankering to do so. Um, it's going to be... It's going to be a beast to get any sort of agenda up for two days after Christmas. So uh, at this time, we are not doing so. Um, we, we Survey number two for the comprehensive plan will be uh, through the month of January and February. We are working with uh, Virginity to um, get that up and running. Um, and they are working behind the scenes um, to, as they've stated, to get more and more data put together um, related to the comp plan. Um, AJ, what did you say the number was for the number of respondents already as to date? On survey one? Yeah. Um, as of this morning, it was 438. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So we're, we're constantly, we're seeing a sure. more and more increase, uh, to the response rate. I think the, the goal is between five to 600. If we can get more the better, but we're, uh, we've reached out to the school district or we've reached out, we're doing everything we possibly can. Um, there's going to be, we're constantly trying to filter ideas of how we can reach out to more people as well internally. Um, we are going to have an internal staff meeting relating to the downtown master plan and um, consideration from what y'all have taken into account and also um, council's direction as well from the last meeting. We're going to be doing that this week and with that we will um, take steps going forward. We haven't really set on a, on a process just yet, but we will be talking about it. So I just want to make sure it's on y'all's radar as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, that, that's it. So. Uh, yes, Vice Chair Chase. Just one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding from watching that meeting that it will not be coming back to PNZ. Is that your understanding as well? I'm going to take some time over the next day or so and watch the recording. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot going on in that meeting. Um, so I need, before I answer that question, I want to make sure that I answer, mm -hmm. that, that I watch the meeting. Fair enough. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't number 10, adjournment. I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. It's been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. <laughs>